this morning, uh, we're going to uh, continue a, a series that we began last week. It's just a, a really short two part series called Winning with People. Uh, you can find cards uh, that you can take notes on um, in the rack in front of you and I encourage you to do that. There's going to be a couple of things that I share with you today that I think will be really, really encouraging to you um, as you seek to kind of be the person that God uh, wants you to be, has called you to be, and you can influence other people's lives for the sake of Jesus as well. And so that's where we're going to take some time to talk about a little bit uh, today. Um, as I shared last week, uh, this material comes from a guy by the name of John Maxwell. Um, John Maxwell's a great preacher, great uh, church leader, and uh, wrote a book called Winning with People. It's just a really, really helpful book with some really practical ideas on how you can influence people, and really, um, for the sake of Jesus, um, which is what we're called to do um, as those who are trying to live for Jesus. Uh, we're supposed to try and help other people um, get to know who that is as well. And um, just this really practical advice last week came from the life of King Solomon. King Solomon is who we looked at last week, and we jumped into the Old Testament book of 1 Kings and looked around there. Just really the place you start is with yourself is what we talked about last week. And today I'm going to uh, kind of close this series by examining the life of someone who's pretty much at the other end of the scale in terms of their luminary status in the Bible. Someone who's never mentioned anywhere else except in the passage that we're going to look at today. But first, I want to give you a little bit of background. See, a lot of folks who study Scripture, they study the Bible, but that's what they do with their lives. They believe that Paul, the Apostle Paul, actually wrote the book of Philippians while he was imprisoned. And Paul wrote this letter, Philippians, it's really a thank you letter to the church that's in a Roman colony city called Philippi. And they had sent him a gift. And they found out he was under house arrest and they wanted to, they wanted to help him out as he's imprisoned in Rome. And in the midst of explaining to the church his own circumstance, the importance of standing strong in their faith, the importance of humility and unity, the need to watch out for false teachers. The Apostle Paul takes time out to mention someone in particular who was probably one of their own, someone who was probably originally from the city of Philippi. His name was Epaphroditus. Try to say that 10 times fast. Epaphroditus is this person's name. And Epaphroditus would actually be considered like a nobody in terms of Scripture. He never had a statue erected in his name. He never became famous because of his great accomplishments. But Paul, the Apostle Paul, he calls him a hero. And the Apostle Paul uses five terms to describe him. I'm going to encourage you, if you haven't gotten a piece of paper, I want you to write these five things down. This is what the Apostle Paul says about Epaphroditus, this rarely mentioned anywhere else uh, person in the Scriptures. Five things that Paul says about Epaphroditus. Paul calls him a brother. Paul calls him a fellow worker. Paul calls him a fellow soldier. Paul calls him a messenger. Paul calls him a minister. And here's what happens. Epaphroditus makes four decisions that require him to give of his very best. And actually, those four decisions are a pattern that we can model our lives on as well. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful for the examples that come to us from Scripture. And God, some of these examples, they can be really intimidating and it's really difficult to, to really kind of wrap our hearts and minds around the sacrifices and, God, the, the, the efforts that some folks put forth in your name. But God, there are other people, people like Epaphroditus. God, his example is such an encouragement because these are things we see from his life that we can do as well. So speak to us today as we look into your word, as we consider the life of Epaphroditus. And we pray this in your name, amen. 
Here's the first thing that I want you to see about Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus loved people. He loved people. And Paul called him a minister. And this is what Paul wrote about him in verse 26, chapter 2 of Philippians. He says, For he longs for all of you and is distressed because he heard, because you heard he was, he was ill. Epaphroditus felt distressed, not by his own sickness, but because he was worried that the Philippians, the people in his hometown, might be worried about him. Seymour Hirsch wrote a really not so flattering book about John F. Kennedy. Anybody here ever heard of John F. Kennedy? He was a guy, he was a president. And the story that was written, in particular this account, contained um, information about the death of John F. Kennedy's son, Patrick, who was born prematurely, and he died of a lung ailment. And there was a secret serviceman named Larry Newman who said, shared the story that while Patrick was fighting for his life, President Kennedy went to see him in the hospital's fifth floor, and it had been cleared of all visitors, kind of standard protocol because the president's coming. And on his way to his room, President Kennedy passed by an open door and he saw two girls, um, three and four years old, playing in the bed. They were terribly burned, they were bandaged. And President Kennedy just kind of stopped and looked. He learned that one of the children would probably lose one of her hands. And without fanfare, the president pinned a note to each of the girls. And after several minutes, he went on his way to his own son's room. But his son Patrick died the next day. See, in the midst of his own pain, in the midst of his own suffering, President Kennedy demonstrated an ability to show care and compassion for others. And this ability to love others, despite your own circumstances, it's critical. The word that's used in the New International Version translation for distressed is also translated in other places as heaviness or faint. So here's a question. Do you find yourself concerned for others in a way that's, that's balanced? It's, it's healthy, to be sure, but it communicates to them that you love them that you love them. And with that in mind, I want to ask you this first question. Do you long for people? Do you long for people? The Epaphroditus also displayed another critical quality that Paul makes mention of in his letter to the, Epa to the Philippians, and, and that's this, that Epaphroditus took risk. Paul called him a soldier. He risked his life for the sake of Christ. Verse 30, we read this. Because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help that you could not give me. When Paul speaks of Epaphroditus risking his life, the word he uses is also a term that's used by gamblers. Even more interesting is the term gamblers would use when making a plea to the goddess of gambling. That word that they used was Epaphroditus. So it's possible what's going on here is the Apostle Paul is engaging in a little bit of word play with his friend Epaphroditus' name to make the point that when we are serious about winning with other people, we will indeed be called to take several risks to kind of take a chance. <clears throat> I heard a story about a pastor who went to a Chicago to speak at a pastor's conference, some sort. He was trying to find a parking space. If you've ever been to Chicago and you're trying to find a parking space downtown, forget it. It's not going to happen. But he circled the block several times, only ending up having to park in a pretty, much, a pretty somewhat questionable location. It had an empty attendant booth, and he didn't realize it, but it had an honor box. You guys know what an honor box is? Where there's nobody to take your payment, but what do you have to do? You have to put money in that box. Well, as he got out of his car, he saw a dubious looking man approaching him there on the streets of Chicago. 
And the pastor in the car realized he didn't have the exact change for the drop box, and so he began searching through his wallet, hoping he might find it, at which point the man who had approached him asked if the pastor wanted him to run across the street and make a necessary change to pay for the honor drop box. Looking in his wallet, looking at the man, the pastor realized he didn't have much of a choice, at which point the man spoke up and said, yeah, I know, I'm not sure I trust someone who looked like me either. But the pastor took a chance, and he sent the man off with the cash to the store across the street. And sure enough, the man came back with the correct change. He handed the pastor the money, at which point the pastor gave the man a generous tip as well, with the realization, this is how the man made his living on the streets. So what's the point of that story? Well, the point is when we refuse to take risk, as it relates to other people, we often end up winding up being the ones who lose out the most. And in this passage from Philippians, Paul is telling the church at Philippi just how much the man means to him on a personal level. Epaphroditus, with little to no thought of himself, literally, literally the story is that he he ran from Philippi to Rome, a distance of over 500 miles. He didn't go in a car. He wasn't in a plane in the harsh conditions of the first century Roman world in order to meet Paul in prison. In Philippians 4.18, Paul says, um, I've received full payment, and even more I am amply satisfied Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, their fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And in doing this, Epaphroditus almost lost his own life. So here's the next question. The next question. Are you the kind of person who willingly lays it on the line? Or do you play it safe? Are you someone who plays it safe? Paul also says in this passage about Epaphroditus that Epaphroditus worked tirelessly, tirelessly. Paul called him a laborer, a fellow worker. In verse 25, he says, but I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker. Worker. That, that's the same word that Jesus used in Matthew 9, 27, when he described those workers as rare You might be familiar with this verse of Scripture where Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The workers are rare. There just aren't many folks. There are just not that many folks who will work tirelessly on behalf of others like this man Epaphroditus. Again, it's important that you you understand it's, it's on behalf of others. Did you know that too much comfort can be a bad thing for you? Literally. There were some researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, who did an experiment. It's been a while. They did an experiment that involved introducing an amoeba. Now, how many of you remember from biology class what an amoeba is? An amoeba is a what? Thank you very much. Right? So they did this experiment with amoeba. And what they did was they introduced this amoeba to a perfectly stress free environment ideal temperature, optimal concentration of moisture, constant food supply. And the amoeba had an environment to which it had to make no adjustment whatsoever. So you would think that this would make this one happy little amoeba. Whatever it gives that. Whatever it is that gives amoebas ulcers and blood pressure, it was gone. Yet, oddly enough, the amoeba died. Apparently, there is something about all living creatures, even amoebas, that demands challenge. We require change, adaptation, and challenge in the way that we require food and air. Comfort alone will kill us. We need to be doing something. We all need to be engaged. And and this is another reason Paul praised Epaphroditus for this tireless effort to make a difference. Oddly or interestingly enough, all we know 
is this sickness, it was just due to his hard work for Christ. And that may sound a little twisted in our ears, you know, difficult to hear in the 21st century. But I do think it begs the question, do you work tirelessly? <laughs> Not recklessly tirelessly, but do you just, do you give it all you got? And Paul tells us through Epaphroditus' life, an example, when we give of our best, when we love people, when we take risk, when we work tirelessly, and finally, we follow Epaphroditus' example because Epaphroditus was what we would call a servant leader. He was a servant leader. Paul called him a minister and a messenger, a servant who was a leader. He was a pioneer. He did the work that no one else would do. Paul said to hold men like him in high regard. He said, therefore, I'm all the more eager to send him, meaning sending Epaphroditus, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the, in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. Paul writes this following encouragement to the church at Corinth in addressing the believer's freedom and attitude, responsibility, in terms of this whole idea of serving or, or living your life. When he writes, so whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Someone once said this, they said, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. See, Epaphroditus embodied what Paul wrote. Ephesians Chapter 6, verse 7, he says, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord and not men. There's a missionary by the name of Doug Sparks. And uh, has anybody ever heard of Navigators? I know they were big years ago, but Navigators is a missionary organization. And... Uh, he met a fellow missionary in the mountains of Taiwan. And this fellow missionary said that he had met the founder of Navigators, a man by the name of Dawson Trotman. The man said, I'll never forget Dawson Trotman. He was one of the most outstanding men I ever met. And, and when asked what Dawson had said that impressed him so much, the missionary replied, oh, I don't remember anything he said. Well, what, what was so outstanding about him? I'll never forget it, the other man said. He shined my shoes. Dawson Trotman was just that kind of person. He, he loved doing things for people. He found enjoyment in discovering little needs that they had and then making it his objective to meet those needs. And we help others by becoming servants of Christ, by being servants ourselves. This is what the Apostle Paul takes note of and draws our attention to in this particular passage. And it leads me to this final question. Do you lead the way in some area of service? Do you excel? You know, I don't like thinking about this very much, but I'm sure we all recall with more than a bit of trepidation the spread of the coronavirus. I mean, we literally... I, I, I don't know about anybody else, from what I understand, 
it hadn't been since the turn of the 20th century that there had been anything like that that occurred in the history of the world. We saw the world literally come to a standstill. Many people had to give up, make sacrifices. But I want to tell you a short story about a group from the third century world that made such incredible difference in how they sacrificed. See, there's this group of Christians that emerged who seemed to have been inspired by the life and the reputation of Epaphroditus. Malcolm Duncan wrote in a book called Risk Takers. These people were known as the Parabolani. And that's a Greek word for risking his life. You'll find that word in Philippians chapter 2, verse 30. The movement began in Carthage in 82, 52, and it lasted for several hundred years. It was a group of people willing to risk everything for the sake of the gospel. Here's the story. Like many other places around the same time, Carthage was petrified of plague. It wrought death and disaster when it struck, and it was merciless in its sweep, claiming the lives of all who stood in its path. So when an outbreak of the plague struck the city of Carthage in AD 232, the local authorities acted swiftly and decisively. Dead bodies were disposed of, and those who were suspected of having been contaminated, they were put outside of the city walls. The impact was enormous, suffering and death and disease on an epic scale. Sounds a whole lot like coronavirus. But the bishop, the bishop of Carthage at that time was named Cyprian. And he acted swiftly. He called the church in Carthage together. He invited them to go and to live among the sick and the dying. He challenged them to give up the comfort and the security of their own well-being and to step into the world of the rejected and the forgotten. Cyprian set the example of Epaphroditus as an inspiration. The Parabolani, this group, became a movement that served the broken, the poor, the forgotten, the vulnerable. Inspired by the example of Epaphroditus, they too, they, they, they also gave up the security of what they knew and embarked on this adventure, really, this treacherous adventure of a lifetime as they served people who had been rejected. And that's the call that still comes to us today. If we're to be effective in influencing others for the cause of Christ, if we really, truly want to win with others, we must have that same attitude of the Parabolani. And as evidenced by Epaphroditus. We have to act as if no one else, no one else can do it. I, I, I got to do it. I can't, I can't count on anyone else. This is what I'm called to do. But here's the extremely good news. Uh, overwhelmingly beautiful news. We aren't alone. And we have promised help in order that we will be empowered to rise to the occasion. But first, we have to be willing to respond to the one who promises to give us everything we need, everything we need in order to offer our very best to those around us. I want to encourage you, if you don't think maybe you have something to offer to other people, uh, that's not true. You do. You, you have your very best you can offer to the people all around you through Christ who will strengthen you to do just that. That's what it means, really, ultimately, to win with people. Just to be the presence of Jesus in a different 
making way. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful that you have called your people not to live in hiding, not to shuttle ourselves off from the rest of the world and to not influence others around us, but instead, God, you've given us a special task. We've been called to influence other people, to make a difference in the lives of other people by serving other people. And God, it's really easy to become cynical, to become kind of stuck in our own ways, Lord, even to become maybe secluded, perhaps cynical, and forget that there are other people who do not know who you are, who've never heard about this God who loves them with an unfathomable love. So, God, give us a chance this week, some small way, Lord, to show other people, to show someone else difference-making love. May we step up to the challenge. May we model our lives after some of the folks we've just talked about over the last couple of weeks. God, so that other people will know that you are real and that you love them. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen.